transmitting video. Let me disconnect and bring up Twitch on my side just to make sure we've got some good audio. So as we're offline for some reason, I don't necessarily believe that. I didn't get my email yet, so. Ah, we are live now, clicking watch now, doing an audio test. There we go, we're good. Okay. Okay, ready? Indeed. Okay, okay <clears throat> three... <clears throat> okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Security in 30. This is uh, episode 283. And I know it's been a long, long time since episodes, but we've always said if we can't find anything really there, we're not going to bore you with a half hour of trying to make something work. We're still at that point that there's not much there, but I think we have a good topic. So let's say hi to Tom. Tom is hi. straight through. He's over there. And I'm Haim, and we're going to just get started with one of the hot topic debates were masks. And obviously, you, you, you can be on either side of this, but let's take this from a security angle. I like masks as a purely security thing. Not Don't worry about COVID or anything else, but it protects your privacy. I mean, we've always said that putting something on your head, putting obscuring your face is generally a good thing. And they're still going, maybe they didn't deploy facial recognition software the last two years. They're going to start doing it in full force as people lose their masks. And maybe being the last one to take it off may not be the worst thing in the world, especially out in public. So I'll leave it to Tom to talk a little more about it, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, masks are fantastic. Uh, now, no security solution, no matter what it is, no matter who's selling it to you, no matter what company behind it, uh, like even Signal, right? It's not bulletproof. It's not a complete 100% this is secure, it will never get hacked solution. There are none of those around, right? The, the bar for security is, is it better? It, are you making ourselves more or less secure? Because security isn't binary. It's this big wavy state of, you know, more or less secure in masks today fall into the more secure, uh, you know, bucket. Uh, it does make you a little bit harder to track through facial recognition means. Now, that said, if we're going back like five years in the United States, at least, because masks are extremely common for people who are uh, ill or feeling under the weather or, uh, you know, uh, immunocompromised or you know susceptible for whatever reason right there's a bunch of different health reasons to wear a mask that are more popular in other nations outside of the united states so if we go back five years ago and you are the only person in your city wearing a mask well okay it's not necessarily harder to track you because you're the only person wearing a mask right um but today when masks are common in the era of covid then yeah you kind of blend in for the most part, um, there's a lot of, you know, ifs, ands, or buts to that statement. Uh, just take this topic as a general overview, and we're not ever going to say that anything is 100% certain. So just keep that in mind. But on the whole, yeah, when you're covering the bottom half of your face, it, uh, it tends to protect you just a little bit from facial recognition. Um, now, of course, we have to talk about the downside, how you can effectively out yourself. Uh, if you have a custom mask with your face printed on the outside of it, which A, is super cool, uh, but B, yeah, if it's a super unique mask that everybody else is not using, um, yeah, you, it's, it's basically the same as facial recognition, right? It's basically the same as not wearing any at all from a security standpoint. Um, so it's, it's fun, it's cool, and if you're doing this for security purposes, maybe pick something that's a little more common or a little more bland. I use a plain black mask. I mean, so again, we are not talking specifically about illness, but we will say that the point of a mask in general is to prevent you from either getting or receiving illness. And the idea was if you wore a mask, 
it would help you with both of those things. Now, I was hoping that the masks would stay, not, 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 no mandates or anything, but after all of this was over, whatever this is, we would be able to freely walk around like in the East Asian countries where if you're sick, you wear a mask. Not that you're contagious or anything, but hey, I'm not 100%. I had this cough. I'm going to wear a mask to protect you and my loved ones and everyone else from getting whatever I have. Turns out it didn't work that way. But again, if you are sick, you wear a mask. Um, it's now we talk about high quality masks, but then you start talking about the privacy aspect and we, and we, and we just spoke about it. I would like it. You know what? You're walking in a public place. You're walking in a supermarket. If, if you, like you said, you are the only one, it's a problem, but if there's a few others, it just throws some some of their tracking into the by the wayside, and it may help. It may help in preventing some sort of tracking. So for those reasons, I think it may be worth considering taking the privacy aspect of it and putting a mask on, like you said, a plain black one or something that doesn't uniquely identify you. Now, the obvious retort to this is, well, if they can't track my whole face, they're just going to track like from the bridge of my nose up. And yeah, that's that's true. That's accurate. But in any tracking system, in any kind of recognition system or machine learning, having more data points is always better. If you remove some of these data points, like, you know, from the bridge of your nose down, as far as facial recognition goes, you are making that tracking less effective. I, I won't ever say that, hey, no one's going to be able to track you from just a picture of your eyes, right? Through like just a visor uh, image. That's not accurate. I'm sure at some point in time, we're going to have perfect tracking for uh, earlobes, for instance, right? Technology only moves forward. It only gets more advanced. Uh, and this podcast probably will be extremely out of date and bad information 10 years from now. But today, by wearing a mask, yeah, you're decreasing the amount of data points available to these machine learning recognition algorithms. And, you know, from a privacy standpoint, that's only a good thing. I mean, if I can get less shaving ads, maybe that would be a better thing. And it's behind a mask. So unless they're assuming that I'm a male who still shaves type thing that I need to shave. I, I don't know. Maybe if I can get less shaving ads, if I can get less ads in general, I mean, I guess I won't. But that would always be a good thing. So I don't know. I, I see I see it as a positive if if out in public. You can throw on a mask. It doesn't have to be a high quality fitting mask, just anything to cover your face until the casinos reban it again, because they will, you know, as soon as, as soon as COVID is over, the casinos will ban this. But in that meantime, you can get a little further, a little more out, not, not being tracked around where you're going, crossing our fingers, hopefully. So on this topic, we started diving into what other kind of tracking can we give an over? To, right? What other kind of uh, high tech and low tech tracking is employed today and, and could be expanded on in the future? And honestly, one of the lowest tech ways is we've all seen it in every kind of cop drama around or even, you know, non cop dramas, just uh, sitcoms that have cops in them. Right. Well, that guy was wearing a red shirt and he had one arm and he killed my father. Well, clothes are a super easy thing to track, especially in colder areas around the winter, or if you have a, a favorite piece of clothing you wear out of the house. Well, guess what? If you're the guy with the red and white striped coat, if you, you always go out in that in the wintertime, well, uh, most people aren't wearing, you know, four or five different coats. Most people just have one good winter coat, at least I do. Uh, and yeah, that could be a tracking data point, right? If if anything becomes regular to you, that's a tracking data point. Now, I'm not saying that you go out and you buy an entire different wardrobe every time you go out of the house, right? This, that is very much low on the convenience scale and potentially high on the security scale, but I don't think you're really gaining too much by doing that. Uh, but it is an extremely low-cost, low-tech way to track somebody is finding a piece of clothing that they wear all the time and pinning that. That's why, you know, police will take casings of shoe prints because most of the time people have a couple pairs of shoes that they rotate through, uh, if not just one pair of shoes they use for everything. And most people aren't going to go out, buy a pair of shoes, commit a crime, and then throw those shoes away unless they're really thinking about it. And honestly, most criminals aren't that smart. 
I, mean, I was going to, I was going to go on that point um, with the clothing to rotate your clothing. I mean, in general, you're not going to buy many. We, we can start the Netflix of, uh, of uh, coat swapping. Just constantly swap your clothes. But in all of these cases, whether it's fashion or motion or movement or whatever it is, as long as you create a pattern, somebody will figure out how to how to exploit that pattern. You take the same way home, you take the same you do you you stop at the same stores, you frequent the same wherever. You take, all of that is, is any sort of pattern will do that. How are you gonna swap coats? I, I'm not I'm I am not swapping coats. Um I guess all my crimes will be committed when I don't have to deal with when I can have different color shirts or whatever it is. But or if you're going to commit a crime, take off your coat. But then again, you're the one without the coat. Exactly. If you're going to commit a crime and try to get away with it, the best thing you can do is try to be exactly like everyone else. Uh, because the more data points there are in a pool, the less chance that you will be uh, implicated singularly. Uh, right, it's it's really just a needle in a haystack problem. All you have to do is make sure that the haystack you fit into is sizable enough that it's not easy to find the needle. We need to create an app that will rotate your wow. Well, on the east coast, the Wawa's around here. Like, oh, you've been to this Wawa too many times at this time. Why don't you go to the other one down the street? For those not on the east coast, uh, the Starbucks method works. Go to a different corner Starbucks. If the barista knows your name, you've been there too many times. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's very low-tech. It's probably something you really shouldn't worry about. Um, but, you know, it bears mentioning that this kind of tracking does happen. And uh, it's extremely useful for catching criminals, right? Because shoe prints exist. Uh, people generally wear the same coats. People have been implicated in video evidence where they, you know, come into a courtroom wearing the exact same outfit that they were on, you know, the, the security camera video committing a crime on. So just something to think, about. not necessarily something to change in your own personal lives. Uh, and I want to flip that. Oh, hold on. I want to flip that 180 degrees. Also, if you're the type of person who is oblivious to things, start looking at the people coming into the same store as you at the same time and everything else. It's it's one thing that you do it, but you're going to start noticing you're going to no start noticing people doing the exact same thing. You're going to see the same people at the same Starbucks at the same time wearing the same type of clothes and everything else. That will also help you in other ways. I mean, not necessarily being questioned by the police, but People may, you may start recognizing people for good or worse and then, and then make your decisions from there on what you want to do next. But it's always good to be obviously cognizant of your surroundings. It's just from a, a pure social and evolutionary aspect, humans are a pattern driven and pattern recognition machines. That's what we do. Uh, we find a pattern in something seemingly random uh, and we both latch onto that, identify that it's a pattern, and carry those patterns out, right? Like, if you're opening the same can of soup in the same way, and somebody hands you a can of a different type of soup, well, you generally know how to operate that, because it's a pattern. Uh, and, you know, for good and for ill, uh, humans are able to craft and manipulate these patterns, you know, for benefits as simple as hey if you see a door you generally know how to operate that depending on whether the handle is vertical or horizontal for push and pull because it's just something natural uh it's something to keep in mind it's a really nice handy i guess rule for everything from security appliances to tracking to uh just product um but that's that's something uh, we can discuss in the Signal Group if you would like to know more about the design of everyday things. Also a great book. Um, but you did mention stores. So how do stores track you? Well, some stores will do something high tech and use like Wi-Fi beacons and Bluetooth pings. But let's go bottom dollar. Let's, let's do the cheapest tracking possible. And that's purchase tracking. Well, if you use the same credit card to buy your groceries, the store could associate the credit card being used to buy the groceries and what you're buying to basically build a list of here are the things purchased on this payment. Now. And it's stupid easy. All stores do it because they just incidentally have that data anyway, because it's basically required to run a business. 
Uh, and if you want to get a little bit more fancy about it, well, offer cheaper prices to club members, right? If you go to Safeway and you get the Safeway card, or if you go to Kroger and you have the Kroger Club card, uh, then, yeah, you are quite literally trading discounts to have your data taken. Not necessarily stolen, it's a transaction, right? Kroger will say, hey, you can buy this bottle of ketchup for $2, or with the club card, uh, it's a $1.80. You're going to save a whole 20 cents, but we're going to put you in a database that knows here's what you purchased, here's when you purchased it, and here's the payment method you used to purchase it. And they have a profile built around you. Now, with these club cards, they usually ask for things like phone number and address and zip code. And then they can build quite literally a demographic map of their, of their users, of their customers, and what they bought. Uh, so they know, hey, this person only comes in during sales, so if we want to get this type of revenue from this type of demographic, we should have a sale on this type of item. It's not necessarily nefarious, but it is used in marketing, analytics, and advertising. Let me ask you this. What do you think? You, I don't know if you know the answer. Take, some, take something like Instacart. So you order your shopping, and somebody either picks it or it gets delivered to your house. They don't do they know your demographics because you're not in the store. Somebody else who is not your demographic is probably picking that out. And yep. I wonder if if they can figure that out. If the company and I, I don't know if Instacart or DoorDash or Uber mm -hmm. or whoever uses this, but if there is a data sharing program or where like the store can purchase that demographic data from those places, then yeah, they could match that up. Uh, if you have super consistent grocery lists, right? If you get an apple, a tube of toothpaste, and a steak, and those are the only three things you buy ever, and you've done that for the past five years, and you go on Instacart and order the exact same thing, yeah, it's not really a hard leap to see that these are probably the same person. They just use a different method to acquire these groceries. So I've never used... I don't go, I'm not the grocery shopper in the family. I, I do go to Costco and I will buy the big purchases, but my wife is the one who goes. But what I'm thinking is if I do Instacart or uh, service from Costco, I don't know if they have to go to the said Costco that I choose, or they can go to any Costco and they can buy that. And again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a father versus somebody who's probably doing Instacart, who probably is dare I say, not a father or not a male or not my age. And I, like I said, I wonder if they can figure it out. Um, maybe they can because they don't really care who the person is because they have your on the credit card, but who knows? It's basically like using a proxy. You are yeah. proxying your groceries. Yes. Right. And all of the, the like known tech and fallibility with proxy servers where, Hey, if you log in to Facebook through a proxy, well, you just de-anonymized yourself because you logged in somewhere. But same thing with groceries, right? Like if your purchase pattern is exactly the same as it was before, or if they use the same Costco, or if they ask for your club card number to give to the register, well, yeah, your, your little yeah. uh, you know, added privacy could be uh, evaporated just in those methods. Also, uh, just like a proxy, you are just transferring where the tracking is actually happening, right? You're going from where the tracking would happen at the store directly with you and your credit card and your purchases to Instacart, knowing you, your credit card, and your purchases. So the tracking is still happening. The data collection is still going on. You just moved who's getting that at one point. In time. Um, but let's, let's talk about like something a little bit more high-tech, like Wi-Fi beacons or Bluetooth pings. Um, there are certain ways to get your phone to respond to these pings. Uh, so your phone generally isn't going to just join any random Wi-Fi network it comes across unless it recognizes that particular access point SSID and it's already configured. So like, if you have logged into the Starbucks Wi-Fi and you're at the drive-thru at Starbucks, well, even if you're using a totally different payment method, even if you're buying something totally different, um, if your phone is close enough to the store, well, it just attached itself to the Wi-Fi. So it knows that you're in the drive-thru. It knows that you might be walking by. It knows you have reached that general location because your phone will just connect to the Wi-Fi. 
It gets even weirder if you are in a totally different city because your phone will join the Wi-Fi. Now it knows that, hey, Tom was in Seattle and then he went to North Dakota and we know he traveled because his phone and his identifier did reach Wi-Fi uh, or did connect to Wi-Fi. Um, now, most modern phones will do things like randomized MAC addresses and uh, other things so that this type of tracking is harder. Uh, but it is possible. There are ways to de-anonymize devices that connect to Wi-Fi. Um, it's not really hard at all. Your system gives out a host name. So if it's a super unique host name, if it's something other than John's iPhone, which is super common in the United States, then, uh, yeah, you can just link up by host name and really understand that if the haystack is small enough, you know the needle is probably... I was not going to go with Wi-Fi. I was going to say more like Bluetooth because Bluetooth is is even more trivial. I mean, you can yep. stick some Bluetooth beacon on like a garbage can, and and they will just it, it will just go to town and just grab everyone who walks by. I mean, yep. If um, so, like if if there are NFC tags around, now, NFC is a really hard thing to accidentally trip. You basically have to like slap your phone against the trigger and you know rub it until it activates. But um I like NFC works the same way. Bluetooth is great for these types of uh applications. It's it's not too hard to make something that you know pings the thing that everybody has in their pocket or in their purse just laying around. It's 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 always hard and this may be a totally separate diversion. When someone says, oh, my phone is listening to me because I got an ad for whatever. And, and we always talk about this on the phone. The phone. Your phone's not listening to you. It's not doing that. It's doing one of these many different things together that you are sending it. And we can spend hours talking about every single signal. Location and data. trying to build a profile. That's mainly the location data. Uh, the other one I found out is uh, what your spouse looks at. Because if it because that that was a little creepy it's what your spouse looks at you are you may be you may have had a conversation you may be interested in or they just don't know a person in your household or someone on your wi-fi looked for this and you're the same age or you're the same demographic and now you're going to get ads for a said thing and that was always a little that also that weirded me out more than me searching for it and getting ads for it for weeks after I know we, we've said this a lot, but it bears repeating because I still hear it from friends and family members. Your phone is not hot micing. Your, your phone is not turning on the microphone and listening to everything you have to say and running it through a, a speech-to-text translator and understanding all of this stuff and then sending you ads for the thing you talked about. No. So to give a, a, really, uh, <laughs> uh, a really personal example... Uh, a family member of mine got ads for blinds. They were, uh, you know, talking about redoing the windows in, in their house and, you know, getting new blinds and window treatments and all that stuff. Just general home renovation. And they started getting ads after they had this conversation. But it turned out that, uh, yeah, the, this family member actually went to a local store that does windows and window treatments and blinds and home renovation type stuff. And they specifically went to a window store and opened up Facebook and it knew where they were because they gave it location access. And yeah, it's not really hard to give people ads for the thing that they want when they're already shopping for it and giving those apps location access to understand where they are. Um, so that was, that's just one example. But honestly, it's just today too expensive to hot mic everyone on the planet's phone and listen to. Your phone isn't doing that. Location data is much smaller, it's much easier to obtain, and generally it's going to be higher quality anyway. Your neighbors, if your neighbors have a conversation, you are close enough to them that the location may make sense for, the, for signals to happen. You are friends with your neighbors, your neighbors are talking about something, they may see, oh, you're close enough, um, location-wise, and you'll get their ads and your neighbors are generally, again, you're at least in suburbia, the same age as you in general. I mean, not always, but for the most part, you're living in an area where you want to be for your type, your, your point in life. So 
it's look, I've always said, I said something and then three days later I get ads for it. I don't know how they figured it out, but I have to remember they're not listening. They're doing other things. Somebody else is searching for it and you're there or you're the same type of person. Kids in classrooms, nobody, everyone forgets about this. You're all in the same location con connected to the same Wi-Fi. If one person's looking for something, the, the, the location apps don't, Tracking apps don't understand it's a classroom. They may think you're one big family. You're in the same spot for the same amount of time every day, going back to that pattern. Um, and maybe they say, wait, maybe it's at work or whatever it is. But again, you're probably the same age. You're probably the same group. We're going to just target it because it may hit. It's not, they're not serving you denture ads knowing that you're what that you're at a school, but they're close enough. They can say, hey, uh, we're going to show you car ads. Well, I don't know. I don't know what teenagers look up these days. So, but then I also get teenager Anti -tracking ads. tracking masks. Well, they're, that's, <laughs> they're definitely not looking that up. I mean, I mean, the newest TikTok, I guess. I don't know. So there are high-tech ways of doing tracking inside of stores. There are low-tech ways. Uh, one of the ways that we've talked about before on this show uh, is license plate recognition, which is super trivial. License plates are a consistent size, a consistent shape. They have a consistent font. Um, so it's really easy to build a model around recognizing and digitizing the information that is on a license plate. And if you are running around in your car, uh, like, you know, a police officer or snow plows or a tow truck um, or just a person who's in their car all day for work, uh, then yeah, you too can strap cameras to your car to collect all of the license plates that you see and over time build a database of where you see these license plates go. You could track somebody to their house and to the grocery store depending on where you're driving around. Um, license plate tech uh, and license plate tracking is scarily common. Uh, so if you're an advertiser and you want to pay somebody to just drive around a, a city all day, you could pretty quickly, within you know a month or two, build a database of where are the people, where are people most commonly congregating, where are the busiest businesses, uh, and it's honestly fairly old school, um, you know, just driving around and observing things. But now you can have a computer do that observability better than just human eyes would, and a lot faster, right? You could just imagine having a robot sitting in your passenger seat, writing down all the, the license plates that it sees and tracking down exactly where on the road it saw them. And after you do that for a few weeks, well, you've got this big database that's super valuable for knowing where people are, where they're driving, where they're parked, uh, and their comings and goings. Um, so we've, we've definitely seen this. We've done a few stories about the police using this, uh, these license plate da databases to try to prevent crime or try to, uh, <laughs> you know, prosecute and catch crimes that have happened with varying success. So is it worth the invasion? Maybe. I, I, wish, I wish I had I had a yes or no for you on whether or not that's worth it, but honestly, that's for the courts to decide and the public at large. So other things that can be not necessarily just license plate, but if you have a unique car and a unique color, if you have a, a bright red race car, well, chances are people are noticing you. You probably get more traffic tickets. That's why bright red race cars have higher insurance rates than other cars, um, especially if your car is unique in some way. So they have a bumper sticker. So they have a scratch or a dent in one particular place that nothing else has a scratch or a dent. Uh, it's basically that uniqueness, right? If the haystack is small, if the, the profile of the thing you're looking for is fairly unique, well, it's really easy to find the needle. It's the signal-to-noise ratio. The best thing you can do for your privacy is to blend in. I mean, I, I just want to play devil's advocate for the last, whatever, 90 seconds here. Maybe we want tracking. Not, not everything. And again, you can't flip the on and off switch. But one of the things I really liked uh, years ago was the fact that Google knew where I was at all times. For whatever reason, it was really nice to say, hey, here's my day for my own personal reasons to say, here, this is like an alibi to to where I was. Somebody says, you were there. You Where were you? Well, here's here's my phone. It says I was at the gym. And it's one of those where I like that. 
and then all of a sudden I started thinking about it and, and maybe I don't want everyone to know that, or maybe I don't want people to buy that. And I'm like, I would kind of want to just track myself without sharing that information. I would like to know these things. And one of the creepiest things I found out is if you're not enrolled in Google rewards, Google will pay you a few pennies uh, to answer some review questions. But the really weird one is you come out of a store when you have your Google Maps on, and it will say, did you just go to the store? Like, almost immediately. Yes. Did you buy something? Yes. Did you pay with credit card? Yes. Can you upload your receipt for us? And that's where I hit no. Excuse me. And they would pay you a dollar for this. And I'm like, a dollar? To know that I went to Wawa? I'll take a dollar. Okay, I'll take a dollar for, for that. But I'm like, I okay, because I know what they're trying to do, and I'm like, I rather the dollar, but then again, that's what they're doing. They're they're paying you a mo- a tiny amount for them to use this to sell to Wawa or to sell to wherever and say, hey, uh, we 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 have a really good idea of when you should advertise and when you shouldn't. But like I said from the beginning, I wish it I could track be, myself. Yeah, it can yeah. even be nicer than that. I I have gotten uh, back when I used an Android phone, I had gotten the Google Rewards uh, specifically looking. at parking spaces was there a handicap parking space was there a wheelchair accessible ramp into the store uh was it accessible to use the store um and like you can imagine somebody who is in a wheelchair and in a strange area they might not know what like whether a store or location is accessible to them or not and being able to look on google maps and see a list of Yes, handicap parking available. Yes, wheelchair ramp available. Yes, ADA compliant entrance ways. That is super, super valuable. And and I'm I'm just gonna flat out say that is a good thing. That is tracking that has led to an actionable, positive outcome for all of humanity. At the very least, an actionable, positive outcome for handicapped people. Um, so it's not all bad. Right, the the tracking isn't necessarily evil itself. It's what we do with it. So I agree with you. I'm just saying it's we we spent the entire time talking about anti tracking, but the problem is sometimes you're going to want to know an answer. Well, let's say you're installing Linux on your desktop and something breaks, you want the forms to be fully updated. If if you have a condition and you want to ask your and you don't want to ask Facebook or you want to search it up, you want to find other people who have this condition and get accurate uh, information and everything else, and that requires people giving up something for it. And and it's just one of those comfort levels, but we want everyone to know that they are tracking almost everything. And I was going to say back to the food store thing. I typed into YouTube at some point uh, how food stores work, and they're incredibly more complicated than you can imagine. They just, they know everything. They know how many bananas to order because they have to. Every banana that's not eaten is a loss. So they need to know exactly how many, and if anything trips it, a storm, adverse weather, a war, I mean, anything, uh, supply chain, all of that shuts everything down and we have problems. But, But they need to know that. So the more they get, the, the better the better your experience is going to be knowing that they have just enough food for you and everyone else and this is this is kind of an aside and I know we're we're over time now yep. but I, you can actually see the downside of a just in time economic model like that where you know exactly how many bananas to order because if anything interrupts that flow you no longer like bananas are a bad example because go bad and Four hours uh, from personal experience. Uh, It's probably more than that, but four hours in my experience. Um, But if anything interrupts that just-in-time economy, uh, like we've seen with COVID, you can get massive, massive supply chain interrupts that drag the entire system down, which is what we're dealing with today. Because we no longer have stockpiles of product. Everything was just-in-time built. Well, when we're not building, things tend to fall apart. Again, you're not tracking, they don't track you. So with that said, we are over time. If you want more tracking questions, come join us in our Signal group. Find us on Twitter. Find us somewhere. We'll get you in. If not, as as long as there's a security topic, we'll talk about it. But I have a feeling the next couple of weeks are going to be a little thin unless something happens. Um, yep. I don't know if there's... T- I think if you look at look at the current political situation, it's going to be the same thing over and over again. So unless 
unless an attack or something comes out. We're here. We're not going anywhere. That's the point. Find us in the single group, and we will see everyone hopefully next week. So, bye, everyone. See you, everyone. Two.